أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد So we begin with our first tafsir class tonight insha'Allah and uh, we are going to be looking at Surah Nuh which is chapter 71 of the Quran Surah Nuh um, is chapter 71, Surah 71 of the Quran. And uh, in addition to studying this Surah and its message um, and what we can learn from it, um, I just want to bring out some of the other things we are keen to look at. We're not just looking at the um, meaning of some key words in the Surah or what the verse refers to. Um, there are some theological concepts within different verses of the Quran, so we're going to bring those out and discuss that. Um, unfortunately, tonight, because there is a program at 8 o'clock, we cannot have our question and answer session. So if you do have any questions, write them down. Um, it is possible that the week after next, when we have our second session, there will also be a program upstairs, so we also may not have a question answer then. But the last three sessions, we should have our Q&A. So we have a total of five sessions, inshallah. Okay. Um, one of the other key um, um, concepts that we want to also bring out in the study of tafsir um, is what is called tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an, where instead of projecting an idea on a verse, uh, we let the Qur'an speak for itself. And everything we prove, we cross-reference it with other verses of the Qur'an. In other words, we take a holistic look at the Qur'an, at anything. And I will show you examples of that. Right? Um, so these are some ideas that we will be bringing out. And I mention this because I want us to understand that these classes uh, we hope they will take a certain academic flavor where we will not just um, take a biased or apologetic approach to say we are Shias, this is what we believe, therefore we already have a certain understanding of the Quran and we just want to prove our point. No, we want to look at it with fresh eyes, fresh minds, so that when we prove a point, we gain conviction through that as well. And therefore, um, I would really, really encourage you to question me uh, when, when we do have a question answer session. Um, I look at you not as students, but as um, equals in the study of the Quran, which means I'm inviting you to challenge what I tell you. If I tell you a certain concept or idea or I offer a certain interpretation, I would like you to challenge me and say, but I think this, or what about this verse, or if you say this, then how would you explain that? So you may have to go back and do some homework yourself, but don't just take things just because I'm um, saying it. Although what I will say, inshallah, I will back it up with uh, evidence from hadith or from the, uh, what other uh, mufassirun or commentators of the Quran have uh, said. Before we get into Surah Nuh itself, we will start with a brief introduction to the Surah. Um, and then at the end of the surah as well, we will also um, do a summary to say what was the message of this surah? What was the synopsis? What was the theme? What was the idea? And, and um, the basic fundamental uh, message that we can draw from this surah if someone was to ask us what is this surah about, right? But for now, we just want to bring a brief introduction. Um, Many surahs take their name from a particular verse in the Quran. So Surah Al-Ankabut, for example, will be called Al-Ankabut because there is a verse that mentions Al-Ankabut. Surah Nuh, however, is about the Prophet Nuh, salam. So it's not based on a particular verse. The whole surah is about him. And as we shall see, it largely discusses what he preached to the people and what their response was. Okay. Um, the Prophet Nuh salam, is mentioned 43 times in the Quran in 29 different surahs. Um, 
This surah is entirely dedicated to him. It's named after him and the whole surah is about him. Even though there are other passages that speak uh, in detail about him. As an example, um, one of the um, aspects of the life of Nabi Nuh was the flood, the deluge that is called the Tufan, and the story of the ark. That's what we all associate with him. Well, the story of the ark and the flood is not told in Surah Nuh at all. There is just a mention in one verse to say that they were drowned. That's all. The entire story of the ark and the flood is found in Surah Hud, which is chapter 11 of the Quran, um, from verse 25 to verse 49. Um, and so I want to also mention that in these five sessions, we're not looking at the life of Nabi Nuh salam. We are looking at Surah Nuh. Those parts of his life that are not in Surah Nuh, we will not discuss. Okay. So it may be a bit disappointing for you if you were looking forward to the whole story of the ark and the flood and what happened and how and thereafter. But we will not be discussing that at all until inshallah we do the tafsir of Surah Hud because of time constraints. Okay. Um, there are many reports and riwayat. When I say hadith, usually I'm referring to something um, that is quite likely authentic, verified from a source like Al-Kafi, where the ulama have investigated the chain of narrators and said this is a sahih hadith. But when I say riwayat or reports, I mean these are there in the books of hadith, um, but we do not know for sure how reliable they are. These are things that have to be reviewed and re looked at. Okay? So that's just a subtle hint when I say reports or riwayat. I'm not necessarily saying it is 100% verified for authenticity. Okay? So we have many riwayat which suggest that Nuh's real name was not Nuh. Uh, but what his real name was, we don't know because there are very many versions. Some say his name was Abdul Ghaffar, some say his name was Abdul Malik, some say his name was Abdul A'la, some say his name was Sakan, uh, and, so, and so on, right? And obviously, because he didn't speak Arabic, his name would have meant Abdul Ghaffar or Abdul A'la, but not necessarily exactly that name. Um, the word Nuh can have many, again, meanings, but the more popular one is that it shares the same root as the word Nawha, which is to lament or to cry. And that is because Nuh, apparently from Riwayat, again, cried for many years, which is again uh, something that is quite popularly known by people. Some say he cried for many years because of his people's disobedience. While preaching to them, he lamented and cried. Um, there is also a popular um, story that has been told uh, and handed down orally for generations and occurs in our books of hadith that say that the reason why he was called, the reason why he cried is that before he began preaching, um, he one day passed by a dog that was very dirty um, and did not look very nice or downright ugly as they put it, qabih in its appearance. And Nuh thought to himself, my God, what an ugly dog. This is in Riwayat. We don't know if it's authentic or not for sure. To which miraculously God made the dog speak. And the dog spoke and said, Oh Nuh, is it me that you find ugly or my creator? Do you find me defective or is it my creator that you find defective? Or in other reports, he, the dog said, Oh Nuh, are you able to create one even as ugly as me? At which point he realized that he was tested by God. And so he lamented and cried for many, many, many years because of which he came to be known as Nuh. Um, I'm not sure how authentic these narrations are because in one narration it says he didn't think the dog was ugly, but he spat on the dog, which I don't think he would do um, as a, a prophet of God and based on his character that we shall inshallah be seeing. His age is also... Um, disputed and uh, according to the Quran Nuh, according to uh, um, Surah 29 verse 14 if I just write a verse and I don't look at it myself 
um, then you can write it down and review it at home. Okay? If I look at the verse myself in the Quran, then feel free to open your Quran and look up the verse with me. Uh, but you'll have to be quick. So according to this verse, it says Nuh lived for a thousand years, less 50, meaning 950 years. And then from Riwayat, again, we are told that he lived longer. And the way they explain the verse, so as not to have a contradiction, is they say the 950 years was only when he was preaching to the people. But after the, the, the deluge or the flood, he then lived for so many years. And then, unfortunately, in the riwayah, that age is also not consistent. In one riwayah, we are told um, he lived for 2,500 years, 2,500. And in another one, we're told he lived for 1,490 years. Um, some of the historians also say that um, in those days it was common for people to live up to 300 years. So Nuh lived for 950 years, he lived long even by their standards. But the human population on earth was very small at the time and so people lived longer. But after the flood, humans multiplied uh, extremely fast. The human population growth accelerated and to balance that, the human age as well dramatically dropped. Um, and soon after the flood, um, we have Nabi Ibrahim salam, that we're told lived for about 120 years. Okay. Um, so it could be a balance of nature where as the population grew, the age uh, began to shrink. Um, and this somewhat agrees with the Christian understanding as well because in the Bible, in the initial first six books, the books of Genesis uh, 1 to 6, there is a detailed story of Noah in which also we are told Noah preached for 600 years and then lived after the, uh, the floods for 350 years. So that agrees with 950 years um, and also the fact that uh, the human population was not so large at the time. Um, he had, uh, we know, more than one wife because one of his wives was disobedient, who was drowned in the flood. Um, he had at least four sons uh, because we know of three sons after the flood and we know of one called Kanaan who was drowned and who is also mentioned in the Quran um, in Surah Hud uh, where it is discussed. And we shall come to a bit of that um, later on. Uh, the Bible has a very detailed story about um, these three sons um, who in Arabic are called Ham, Sam, and Yafith, or in the Bible are Ham, Sam, and I think Japheth or something like that. Um, what is interesting is that one of the reasons the Quran was revealed was to correct the um, false um, uh, ideas about the prophets of God. Uh, particularly in the Old Testament or what is called the Hebrew Bible or the Torah. Um, there are a lot of things there that point fingers at the isma or the infallibility of prophets. For example, in the Bible, even in the, in the New Testament, there is the idea of Jesus turning water into wine or Jesus speaking to his mother and saying to his mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? Right? And that's why the Quran, you find that Isa, alayhi salam, when he speaks from the cradle, he says, I have been made kind to my mother, right? وَبَرًّا بِوَالِدَتِي and so on. So it balances that. Or for example, in the Bible, you have the story of Lut alayhi salam, Nabi Lut, and that it has some unspeakable stories about between him and his daughter and how they procreate and so on. Similarly, regarding the story of Nuh, um, in the Bible, after the flood, Nuh is very depressed and he looks for a way to relieve himself of his sorrow and suffering and somehow he stumbles upon wine. And so there is this idea that Nuh is the one who invented wine. And he began drinking wine and he was drunk all the time. And one day he's in his tent um, and he's naked. And one of his sons sees him naked and begins laughing at him. And the other two sons come in and they cover their father, to which the, 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 um, the Old Testament then says that Noah blessed these two sons and cursed the one son. And then he sent these sons to different parts of the world, one to the west, one to the east, and one to Africa. The one who was cursed was sent to Africa, and as part of his curse, his children were blackened. 
And in the 17th and 18th century, black slavery was justified, right? Uh, amongst the Europeans and amongst the Christians, black slavery was justified on this basis that these are the descendants of the cursed son of Noah, okay? Which obviously does not agree with the Quran. Then there's the issue of women and, you know, Hawa or Eve is to blame for the fall of Adam and all these things. So when today, and I bring this up because in today's world, when we see books being written accusing our prophet, you know, of things like, you know, the prophet of Islam, Naudhu Billah, is a terrorist or he married a nine-year-old girl or this or that, you should not be surprised. There is a precedence where all prophets were uh, accused of things falsely. It's just that the Quran was revealed in his time, so there is no revelation to defend his character and to clarify all these things as it does for uh, previous prophets. Um, we shall see that Nuh salam, was particularly patient and steadfast in his, in his preaching. We shall also see that Nuh salam, was one of the first prophets who debated with people using logic and talking about science and about nature and arguing on that basis for the existence of God. Okay, so he was not an ordinary prophet. Um, he is regarded uh, as one of the five uh, ulil azm prophets, the prophets of determination, who are Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are the five prophets, alayhi salam, who are the ulul azm. He is also one of the um, uh, sahibu sharia. Okay. Um, even though we don't know of any particular book revealed to Nuh, uh, but he brings a certain um, legislation to the people. Um, and if you look at the verse that I just wrote down, which is chapter um, 42, um, verse 13, you see um, the verse reading that shara'a, meaning Allah, he Allah, Shara'a lakum min ad He, Allah, has prescribed for you the religion. Ma wassa bihi nuhan walladhi awhayna ilayka. Which he enjoined upon Nuh and which we have also revealed to you, meaning Muhammad. Okay. Wa ma wassayna bihi Ibrahima wa Musa wa Isa. And the verse continues. But within this verse, you see that these five prophets being mentioned. Okay. And therefore, he is part of these group of five who are uh, the most eminent um, of the uh, prophets. Some uh, Mufassirin, muf many of the early Mufassirun of Quran have argued that Nuh was the first Rasul, that all before him were Anbiya. We know that Nabi Idris came before him, and we know Nabi Adam came before him. Essentially, there were 10 generations between Adam and Nuh. And in one report, we're told all 10 were prophets. So some of the early Mufassirun say that no one was a Rasul before Nuh. But we know this is not true. And again, everything we argue, we must prove from the Quran. So if we look at um, verse 25, I mean chapter 25, verse 37. Okay. Um, and even though this hasn't got into the chapter of Surah Nuh, I am doing this on purpose to show you that there are things that are said to you. Um, Twenty-five, thirty-seven. Um, okay. I think that's that's a wrong reference. I think because it's not seems it doesn't seem to be. Uh, proving the point I want. Um, there is a verse of Quran, I will try and pull it up for you next week, but there is a verse of Quran that speaks that we sent Rusul before Nuh. Okay? And uh, this is not the reference. Okay? I seem to have got the wrong uh, verse. I will inshallah um, find that for you and uh, mention it. Is it? Why am I not seeing it here, 25? وَقَوْمُ نُوحٍ وَقَوْمَ نُوحٍ لَمَّا كَذَّبُوا الرُّسُلَ أَغْرَقْ Yes, okay. 
It is actually, sorry. I wasn't reading it right. And the people of Nuh, Lamma kadhabu rusula agrak nahum. When they belied, when they called the prophets, the Rusul liars, we drowned them. So the fact that Rusul are mentioned in plural um, proves that there was more than one Rasul before they were drowned. Okay? And so that proves to us that um, Nuh was not the first um, Rasul. Um, two more points to end the introduction to the surah before we get into the surah itself. Um, as most of you would know, the order in which the surahs of Quran are compiled is not the order in which they were revealed. Right? For example, we know Surah Iqra was revealed first, the opening verses, but it's not the first surah in the Quran. Surah Nuh is interesting because it is the 71st surah of the Quran, but it is also the 71st surah to be revealed. Okay? It is like Surah Al-Infitar, the 82nd Surah, which is the 82nd and also the 82nd to be revealed. So there are Surahs or Surah like that. Um, and it is one of the last Makki Surahs. It is a Makki Surah. It was revealed in Mecca before the Hijra of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But uh, it is one of the last Makki Surahs. There was just a few Surahs after that uh, before the migration. Um, the final point I want to draw your attention to is for those of you um, who can um, recite the Quran in Arabic, this surah is not very long. It has 28 verses, but it has a rhyming end. All the verses end with a rhyme. And therefore, it is very um, easy to memorize. Okay? And so I would like to encourage you that in these uh, five sessions we have every other week, which means we have about 10, 10 weeks, uh, until the month of Ramadan, inshallah, if you are able to uh, try and memorize this surah, at least try and memorize the verses we discuss every night, and that way by the end of our sessions you will have known the surah by heart, inshallah, and it is also very beautiful. You will enjoy um, reciting it when you're praying on your own uh, early morning after sal in Salatul Fajr and so on. Okay, so we get into the surah itself now, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, what I like to do is to um, break up the surah into logical subsets um, and for our initial uh, look, the first section, I would like us to look at verse 1 to 4, which is sort of a summary of what Nuh preached to his people. Okay? And so the surah begins by saying, إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ أَنْ أَنْذِرْ قَوْمَكَ مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ إِنِّي لَكُمْ نَذِيرٌ مُّبِينٌ أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاتَّقُوهُ وَأَطِيعُونَ يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ وَيُؤَخِّرُكُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى إِنَّ أَجَلَ اللَّهِ إِذَا جَاءَ لَا يُؤَخَّرْ لَوْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Indeed we sent Nuh to his people saying Warn your people before a painful punishment overtakes them. He said, O oh my people, indeed I am a manifest warner to you. Worship Allah and be wary of him and obey me, that he may forgive you some of your sins and respite you or give you time until a specified time. Indeed, when Allah's appointed time comes, it cannot be deferred should you know. Now, I want you to sort of see the difference when you first read the verse, it looks so simple, you think, I've understood it all. What is there that's not obvious here? And then look at what happens as we get into the surah and how it opens up different um, ideas and doors. The very first verse, uh, we are told uh, that we sent Nuh to warn the people. And the second verse says, he went and said, I am a manifest warner. And then the third verse, he asks them to do three things. Worship Allah, be wary of him, meaning be conscious of him, which we call in Arabic, have taqwa, okay? And obey me, right? In chapter 11, verse 25, it is one verse, but it combines the first and the second verse, okay? 
Um, and in chapter 7, verse 59, it is one verse, but it combines all three in one verse. Okay? Just to show you an example. Uh, and again, I want to look at this because you will see a certain difference. Okay? So 11.25 says, Certainly we sent Nuh to his people to say, Indeed, I am a manifest warner to you. Do you see how it has combined the two verses? It has got the we sent Nuh, and it has got Nuh saying, I am a manifest warner to you. Okay? But the verse after that, which is 11.26, Nuh asks for only one thing. Worship none but Allah. He doesn't mention, be wary of him and obey me. Okay? If I look at um, 759, um, it says, certainly we sent Nuh to his people. He said, O oh my people, worship Allah. You have no other God besides him. Indeed, I fear for you the punishment of a tremendous day. So now he's combined, uh, he's combined three things. One is we sent Nuh, which was the first verse in Surah Nuh. Second is um, he's telling them worship Allah, which was the third verse in Surah Nuh. And then I fear for you the punishment, which is the second verse where he said, I am a manifest warner um, to you. What was he warning them about? He was warning them about shirk, because they were primarily idol worshippers. Okay? And shirk, as you know, is called in the Quran, Dhulmun Azim. It is a great injustice. In, uh, in uh, chapter 31, verse 13, shirk is called Dhulmun Azim. Okay? And uh, Allah, in two places in the Quran, says, that Allah will not forgive anyone who associates a partner with him. Inna Allah la yughfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalik. He will forgive all else besides that. Which is both in Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, as well as chapter 4, verse 116. In both these places, Allah speaks of this as being an unforgivable uh, um, sin. There is a strong comparison between Nuh salam, and our Prophet, or the final prophet. And we shall be seeing these comparisons as we study the surah. But just like Nuh was told, warn your people, we see that uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well, in, in chapter 74, verse 2, he is told, Qum fa'andhir, rise and warn. Right? So that idea of warn your people um, is, is given to all prophets, but specifically, um, uh, you will see a strong resemblance to our prophet. Some scholars believe that Nuh's warning, he said, I am a manifest warner, that is a summary. The details of that warning is the third verse, which says, worship Allah, be wary of him, and obey me. Okay, and we shall look at that. When we come to verse 3, we're still looking at verse 1. The first question that should come to mind is, what is this painful punishment that Nuh is warning them about? Is he warning them about the flood, or is he warning them about the hereafter, the fire of hell? Because he calls it Adabun Alim. And the Mufassirun again have gone back and forth on this to try and prove what it might be. But we will conclude that it is both, even though his emphasis was the hereafter. How do we conclude this? Okay, because if I was to put this question to you, you cannot simply go and go by saying, I think it must have been the hereafter, or I think it must have been the flood. You have to prove that. What is this adabun alim that he's talking about? Okay? So we take a certain logic in proving this. Okay? How do we do this? I'm demonstrating to you how I go about proving this. And as I said, I'm inviting you to challenge me and say, no, I don't agree with you because of this and that. The first point is that in chapter 4, Verse 165, Allah says that we sent all messengers, all apostles, all rusul as mubashireen and mundireen, as bearers of good news and as warners. So they brought good news of Jannah and they came to warn about Jahannam. 
okay? because not every community was destroyed by a flood. But every messenger came as a warner. So that warning must have been to do with the hereafter. The second thing is that I'm trying to prove that Nu warned them about both things. The second proof is that in this very surah, surah Nu, further down, if you look at verse uh, 25, um, Allah says they were drowned and then they were made to enter the fire. Okay? He said, Ughriku fa udkhilu nara. So both punishments are mentioned, the drowning and the entering of the fire. So whatever he warned them would have covered um, both of this. Earlier on, when I was showing you how the three verses of Surah Nuh are summarized in one verse here, in Surah 50, 759, if you remember, we saw that when Nuh warned them, he said, I warn you of a tremendous day. Right? He warned them of a tremendous day. And uh, in uh, this verse as well, the verse after it, 1126, Nu again mentions a day. He says, he warns them of the punishment of a painful day. So in this uh, Surah Nu, okay, in this Surah Nu, the first verse, he mentions Adabun Alim, a painful punishment. But in 1126, he mentions a painful day, Yawmun Alim. So the painful is the same, which shows us he's talking about the same thing. But now he's mentioning a day. And normally when the Quran refers to a tremendous day or a painful day or a mighty day, it's talking about the one day that is a major theme in the Quran, which is Yawmul Qiyamah. So he was certainly emphasizing a warning about them not losing their souls for eternity. Basically, he was warning them about eternal damnation. But we also know that he was also warning them about punishment in this world. Even if at the start, Nuh may not have known that they were going to be destroyed with a flood, he may just have known that punishment would descend. Because when you read Surah Hud, there is a certain point at which, in these verses here, there is a certain point at which Allah says to Nuh salam, that, O oh, Nuh, no one will now believe in you except those who have already believed in you. So now build an ark under our eyes. Wasna il fulka tahta ayunina. Like build an ark and we will watch over you. Um, so he may not have been specific about the flood, but he knew that there was a danger of them being punished in this world. How do we know that? We know this because if you look at 1132, which is chapter 11, verse 32, you will see that um, the people of Nuh are uh, mocking uh, their prophet. And they're saying to him, the verse starts where they say, Qalu ya Nuh. They said, O oh Nuh, you have disputed with us already. And you have disputed with us exceedingly. Now bring us what you threaten us with if you are truthful. Okay? So they couldn't have been talking about the Day of Judgment because they understand the Day of Judgment happens at the end of the world. The mere fact that they say in this verse, bring us what you threaten us with, suggests that he was threatening them with something. He was warning them of something in this world. And that is proof that he was warning them about a punishment in this world as well. Okay. Uh, and the final argument is actually in this chapter 11, verse 39, okay, where Nuh actually mentions two types of punishment. So verse 38 says that as he was building the ark, whenever the elders of his community would pass by him, they would ridicule him, they would laugh at him. And he would say to them, if you ridicule us today, we shall ridicule you tomorrow just as you ridicule us. Then he says in verse 39, فَسَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ مَنْ يَأْتِيهِ عَذَابٌ يُخْزِيهِ وَيَحِلُّ عَلَيْهِ عَذَابٌ مُقِيمٌ Soon you will know whom a disgraceful punishment will overtake and on whom a lasting punishment will descend. 
So there, is a, there are two punishments being mentioned. One is a disgraceful punishment which will overtake. So typically the punishment that comes in this world, if you read the Quran holistically about the punishment that descended on different communities, Hud and Saleh and Lut and Shu'aib and their people, you will find talk, God talks of the punishment seizing them suddenly, overtaking them while they are asleep and so on. And therefore, the disgraceful punishment that will overtake them, that Nu is saying, soon you will know, he is referring to the flood, the Tufan. And on whom a lasting punishment will descend. So the punishment that is lasting is obviously the punishment of the hereafter. Okay? And therefore, based on this verse then, when we cross-reference, we then conclude that when Allah in Surah Nu, the very first verse, says to Nuh, warn your people before a painful punishment overtakes them. He is talking about um, both types of punishment. Okay. There is one argument that you might raise here though. Does anybody want to say that before? As to, can anyone think of one reason why you might argue to say that this warning was not about the hereafter, it was only about the punishment in this world? You might argue that in this verse, God says punishment, painful punishment overtakes them. And the verse that I just read, out of the two punishment, there was one that overtakes. And one was lasting. Right? The first punishment that was in this world. So you could cross-reference it that way. If you take the Arabic words on the two and say um, that when he says, man uh, ya'atihi, adabun yukhzi, so the word used is ya'atihi. And we look here and it says, Min qabli an ya'atiyahum. Okay? When you match two verses in the Quran to say, could this verse be connected to that verse, you cannot go by the English translation. You have to go by the Arabic. Okay? But here the Arabic word matches exactly. Because here it says before it overtakes you, and there it says overtakes for the first punishment. So one could argue on that basis. One of the things we will learn as we do tafsir is that because it is an uh, academic study, we don't necessarily argue a point until we know the answer absolutely and say this is what it means. Sometimes we must resign to the fact that these are possible answers and it could be any one of them. And then we must move on without knowing for sure. Okay. It is only a masoom imam who can tell you for sure, or a prophet, that this is exactly what it means. Okay? But I'm taking you through this process just so you understand that when you want to prove an argument, what is the, um, the, the process by which you might argue. Now, this is, we're still on the first verse. Now, there is another argument that happens with this verse amongst the Mufassirun. The argument is this. Was Nuh sent to the whole world or was Nuh sent to one community? The popular belief is that the whole world was drowned. But there are scholars who say no, it was a flood only in their area. It was like a tsunami. It just hit their town and their area. It was just the Middle East and Nuh, by the way, is said to have been born and raised in present day Iraq. And in particular, we shall see he built the ark where Masjid Kufa stands today. Okay? And his home was in Masjid Kufa. And he is buried in the same uh, darih shrine as Imam Ali salam in Najaf. Right? Um, so was Nuh sent only to the people of Iraq or was he sent to the whole world? So now there are two arguments. I'll present the arguments first and then we'll look at it. The first argument is that, well, look at the first verse. It says, we sent Nuh ila qawmihi. We sent Nuh to his people. We didn't send Nuh to the whole world. So if he wasn't sent to the whole world, what crime did the rest of the world commit that they should all be drowned? Okay, keep that aside, we park that. This very same surah, if we jump ahead for a moment and we look at uh, verse 26 of Surah Nuh, we see that Nuh is now cursing, invoking God's curse. He says, Rabbi la tadhar ala al-ardi min al-kafirina dayyara. 
My Lord, do not leave on the earth any inhabitant from amongst the faithless. So this is the other argument. He is saying, don't leave anyone on the earth. Okay. Do you see the, the, the issue here? Okay. Um, we know that even before Nu cursed them, um, in chapter 11, verse 36, Allah also mentions to Nu uh, that it is his people who will not believe. It says in chapter 11, Surah Hud, verse 36, it was revealed to Nuh, أَنَّهُ لَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا مِنْ قَوْمِكَ إِلَّا مَنْ قَدْ آمَنَا None of your people will believe except those who already have faith. Okay? So Allah is not saying to Nuh, none of the whole world will now believe. He says, your people. So there is um, an issue here that needs to be um, resolved. The implication of this debate, obviously, is that whatever we'll conclude, whether Nu was sent to his people or to the whole world, will also tell us whether the flood took place in the whole world or only in his community. Okay? There is one Mufassir who says that uh, Nu was sent only to his people. It is only our Prophet, Rasulullah who had the honor of being sent to the whole of mankind, why? Because he says in chapter 34, verse 28, Allah talks about uh, his final prophet and he says, We sent you kafatan lin nas. We sent you for the entire mankind. So he says, This is an honor only reserved for uh, the prophet. Okay? However, from riwayat, we are told he was sent to the whole world. One of the Mufassirun resolves this conflict with an interesting theory. He says, because the world population was not so large, at that time, the whole world lived in the area that Noah lived in. So it's really one and the same thing. Okay. Um, and some people say, well, the whole world was worshipping idols, except those believers who are with Nuh. So Nu had a right to curse the whole world. Can we take that argument? That the whole world, let us suppose there were people in Africa, in China, that were all worshipping idols. Okay? And Nu wanted Allah to remove shirk from the earth, and he cursed them. He could not have done that. Now you might say, well, that's not fair. But why is it not fair? He's removing shirk. Exactly. But we prove that from the Quran. Everything we, we, we argue, it seems logical, but we prove that from the Quran. And we will offer it with two proofs. One is chapter 17, verse 15. Okay. Um, another is chapter 6, verse 131. Okay. And you can look this up later if you like. I will just read it out for you here. In chapter 17, verse 15, Allah says, we do not punish any community until we have sent to it a Rasul. And in chapter 6, verse 131, Allah says, This is because your Lord would never destroy the towns unjustly while their people were unaware. Okay. So the Quran itself disagrees that any community would be destroyed for their sins if they haven't been warned. Okay. So we come back to this issue then. Now, some of the scholars have even quoted a hadith that says that the Prophet of Islam, peace be on him and his family, said that Nuh was sent specifically to his people, but I have been sent for mankind in general. So then, if that is the case, how do you resolve this issue where Nuh is still saying, do not leave on the earth any inhabitant? The only answer that at least I have found, is that the small population would explain that all the people lived in that region. So when he said, do not live on the earth, he meant his community, the people of his time. Okay? Whether that flood then went and covered other parts of the world where there was no human habitation um, would then be irrelevant. We don't know. 
Okay, but it wouldn't be important because there wouldn't be anyone drowning there. Um, as for this hadith, the way to explain it by you know, some of the scholars is that when the Prophet said, Nu was sent specifically to his people, but I was sent to all people, what he meant was, even if he was sent for the whole world, he was sent to the people of his time only. Whereas our Prophet was sent to all mankind in the sense that even after his time, until the day of judgment, he is still the Prophet sent to them. Even today, he is the Prophet sent to the humankind. Okay? So, this brings us to the end of our discussion on the first verse. Now, we come to the second verse. Qala ya qawmi Inni lakum nadirum mubin. He said, O oh my people, indeed I am a manifest warner. Here we are told by the scholars that if you read the Quran carefully, you will see that all the uh, uh, prophets had this tendency and habit that when they spoke to their people, they said, Ya qawmi, Ya qawmi. Okay? I'm going to erase this uh, because this is a convenient location for me to write down references. Um, the reason why Nuh says Ya Qawmi is to build a bond, to create empathy. Okay? He is the Prophet of God, but he does not say, O oh people, worship Allah. He says, O oh my people, Ya Qawmi. And in doing that, he is teaching us how to do tabligh. That when you want to do tabligh, whether it is to the community, or whether it is to your child at home, or whether it is to your brother, or whether it is to a non-Muslim at work, you first build empathy, you build, you show sincere care and love for the other. He, they, are, they are idol worshippers, but he starts by saying, oh my people. Okay? And uh, uh, in saying, oh my people, it is as if he is saying, I am one of you. What hurts you hurts me. I do not wish anything for you except what is good for you. Okay, uh, and this is also the reason why Allah always sent prophets to his to their own community, or to put it differently, Allah always raised prophets from amongst the same community that He wanted to guide. He didn't send a prophet from another community. Um, I have lots of references here um, of different prophets who all said Ya Qawmi, Ya Qawmi. Okay, but in the interest of time, I won't write it all down. But essentially, uh, you have Nabi Saleh, Nabi Shu'aib, Nabi Lut, Nabi Musa, Nabi Harun, and our Prophet as well. They all have references in the Quran where they talk to their communities saying, Ya Qawmi. The only exception is Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, you see, for you to belong to a community, typically you go by your father. Your father's family is your tribe. Okay, that is the traditional understanding at least in the early um, generations. Which means, um, if you are from India, and your, your father was from India, and your mother was from China, you would be regarded as being from the Indian community. But if your father was from China, and your mother was from India, then you would be from the Chinese community. You go by your father's uh, uh, tribe, and community, and family. So, Isa alayhi salam doesn't have a father. So if you read um, Surah to Saf, chapter 61, verse 6, uh, where Isa salam, speaks, you will find that the verses just before this, when Musa salam, speaks to Banu Israel, he says, Ya qawmi lima tu'udhunani wa kad ta'alamuna inni rasulullahi ilaykum. O my people, why do you give me so much trouble when you know I am a messenger of God to you? But he says, Ya qawmi. And then a few verses down, when you come to Isa alayhi salam, he doesn't say, Ya Qawmi, he says, Ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum. Okay? So he is unique uh, in that sense. Now, Nuh could have simply said, I am a warner to you. He says, I am a manifest warner. Inni lakum nadirun mubin. Okay? The reason he says manifest is to emphasize that there is no ambiguity or doubt in his message, nor in the warning he brings. So he calls himself a manifest warner because the warning he is bringing has no doubt in it. It is very, very uh, certain and clear and obvious. 
What is the response of the people when he says, I am a manifest warner to you? The response of the people is given to us in verse 7, 60. Now look at how they make fun of him. Okay? And I'm going to try and move fast so that we finish. I was going to finish four verses, but I think we'll only finish these two because we had to do an introduction to the surah as well. And then I will review this and maybe start leaving out certain details um, from next week so that we can finish the surah, inshallah, within the time uh, of our five sessions. If you look at verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 60, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ The elite, the elders of the community, and we shall talk about them at length when we come to that. They said, إِنَّا لَنَرَاكَ فِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Okay. They said to him, indeed, we see you in manifest error. So if you put the two verses together, you can see that they're making fun of him. Because he said, I am a manifest warner to you. They said, we see you in manifest error. Okay. They're basically mocking him. This is their response. When they mock him, um, if you look at uh, chapter 54, Surah Tul Qamar, verse 9, they call him a crazy man. They call Nuh a crazy man. Okay? And if you look at uh, chapter 11, verse 38 as well, it says that every time the elders of the community would pass by, um, they would make fun of him and ridicule him. Okay? In response to this mockery, when he says, I am a manifest warner, and they say, you are in manifest error, what is his response? Okay. We continue with this, uh, this 760, where they make fun of him, and they say, you are in manifest error. The verse after this, 761, no response. Look at his response. He says, O oh my people, I am not in error. Rather, I am an apostle, I am a messenger from the Lord of the worlds. I communicate to you the messages of my Lord, and I am your well-wisher, وَأَنْصَحُ lakum, And I know from Allah what you do not know. Okay? Now, there is something very important here that I want to just sort of mention. Let me see if there is more to this verse, um, or we could, yeah. Um, there isn't much, so we could sort of conclude on this point. The important point I want to show you here is Nuh's, Nabi Nuh's compassionate nature, okay? That he does not respond to sarcasm in the same manner, okay? He remains humble, he remains sincere in wanting to guide them. The more obnoxious they get, the more rude they get, the nicer he becomes, okay? And this in turn encourages them to become even more cruel to him. Which means it brings out a nature, our nature within us. It is like, for example, if you have a compassionate, kind nature, and you, for a moment, lose control of yourself, right? You just get angry. You have a little child at home. The little child is just crying and crying, and you just lose it for a moment, and you just slap the child. For example, God forbid, you just slap the child. Now the child begins crying. If you have a compassionate nature, you will immediately regret that. You will pick up the child, you will apologize to the child, you will kiss the child, right? Because you know you have done injustice. But if you have a cruel nature, what will you do? Which is what you see what happened in Karbala, right? The more the child cries, the harder you will hit the child. Until you possibly even kill the child, right? Why? Because it is your nature that when you are faced with kindness, you become worse instead of better. Okay? And there is a great, great lesson in this for us to reflect on our own selves and our nature. To see, sometimes what happens is we are, let's say as an example, a common strife in relationships is in marriage. Okay? We're married to a spouse who is perhaps not as quote-unquote nice as we are. Okay? Or everybody believes I am nicer than the other. Right? What we do is over a period of time, after being married for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, we change and perhaps because of survival, we try and say, well, if he's going to be rude, I'm going to be rude. If he's going to be like this, I'm going to play the same game. Right? What we're learning from the Quran here is that the more people mock you, 
you should not compromise on your being nice, your values. Let your niceness influence and change others, but do not let others influence and change you. Okay? And so we see, as we get deeper into the surah, you will see that they continue tormenting Nuh, but he continues persevering. And it's important to understand this so that when we come to the part where he's cursing them, you will understand his cursing does not come out of anger or hatred. It comes from something else that we shall talk about. At one point in chapter 26, verse 116, they actually threaten to kill him. And they say to him, O Nuh, if you do not relinquish, you will certainly be stoned to death. Okay? So um, I'm going to stop here. Um, I just want to give you a, a comparison. I told you Nuh and our prophet, lots of comparisons, right? Like warning and so on. Um, in chapter 22, verse 49, okay, um, our beloved prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says, O oh, mankind, now he doesn't say, O oh, my people, he says, O oh, mankind here, because he is to all of mankind, I am only a manifest warner to you. Okay? And in chapter 21, verse 36, um, you find the same reaction where the people make fun of our prophet. And what they say is, whenever the faithless see you, O Muhammad, they only take you as a joke. They take you in derision. They say, is this the one who speaks ill of your gods? Okay? They basically made fun of him in the same idea. So we stop here.